And so today we pick back up in James 5, 7, where James turns his attention back to his brothers and sisters in Christ. And before we jump in there, I wanna pose a couple of questions to you that we'll come back to as we work throughout the morning. Here's one. Have you ever been done wrong by someone and you weren't sure how to rightly respond? Or this, are you struggling or have you struggled to do the right thing in an environment where the wrong thing seems to reign? Or what about this? Do you find that your faith in this moment is weak? Because suffering and pain are so strong, whether that pain and suffering is yours or maybe is someone that you love and care about or maybe it's just the world that you find yourself living in. If any or all of those are you, have been you, potentially will be you, let's hear what the Spirit of God would like to say through the Word of God because what you have walked through, what you are walking through, what you will walk through, though it might be unique to you, it's not uncommon. As a matter of fact, every one of us has walked through seasons of being hurt by others. You could tell that story. If I handed you a microphone in, every front, of, in front of everybody today, say, you tell us a story about a time you've been mistreated, misunderstood. You go, yeah, no problem. You've looked on as those that you care about have been hurt by other people. You and those that you love have experienced seasons of suffering and hardship on some level. And you know what I know that James knew. When people are mean, when people are unkind, when people are ruthless, the temptation is to fill in the blank retaliate, fight back, hold a grudge, complain, grumble, blame, self-protect, win the argument, prove my point. Or when you think God is the one who is mean, when you think God is the one who is unkind, when you think God is the one who is ruthless. Because of the pain and suffering you're walking through or the pain and suffering of someone you love that they're walking through, the temptation is to fill in the blank. Complain, grumble, blame, hold a grudge, walk away. James actually encourages us and these followers of Jesus that he's writing, he encourages a different response. It's a, it's a response that brings alignment with what we say we believe about God and how we actually live day in and day out. Even on especially during the hard days and the difficult seasons. Look at verse seven with me, if you would. We'll just kind of walk through it. Verse seven of James five. Be patient therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Hit pause right there. A couple of things. You once again read James' pastoral tone to his brothers and sisters in Christ, and it's clear that he's returned to addressing them because the therefore, is referencing what we looked at last week, the fact that they've been taken advantage of and dealt with poorly by the rich landowners. And you can clearly see in the verse right here, you all see it either in front of you or up on the screen, you can clearly see that James says to these followers of Jesus, in light of their hardship and their mistreatment and their suffering, James, James clearly says, retaliate, fight back, revenge. I'm being facetious. Uh, James says two words. You read them, I read them. What does he say? He says, be patient. And they're probably like, oh man, right? Like, can you imagine receiving this letter? James has been talking about several different things with you. He's called out a couple of things even in your own life. You need to be looking if there's congruence. And then you come to chapter five, the first part of chapter five, and you start reading it. And you're like, yeah. They're gonna get theirs. I like this, this is awesome. Keep going, I hope all of five and, anyway. And then we, nope, return back, be patient. 
And again, here's what I know that you know, that James knew, being patient doesn't come easy. I mean, impatience, now that, that is very easy for me. Like you might be, maybe you can relate, you go, yeah, yeah, impatience, I got that down. As far back as I can remember, I've been impatient. Can you relate to that? I'm never less of a Christian <laughs> than when I am in a traffic jam or really anywhere in the Woodruff Road Five Forks area. Like there is a reason I do not have that leaf on my truck. <laughs> you can't make me put it on there. Now here's the deal. That's impatience in everyday life things, which seems to be enough of a challenge for many of us. But James is telling them to be patient in the midst of really hard things, suffering, being mistreated, being taken advantage of by others. These are real issues, hard things, difficult times for them. And that's why James ties this command to be patient to Jesus's return. He says, be patient until the coming of the Lord. Being patient is applying what James said just a few verses earlier that we looked at last week. It says over in verse four of chapter five, the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. So what is coming to those who have oppressed and put their trust in their riches and in their wealth? Judgment. Justice will be served. So let me ask it again. Have you ever been done wrong by someone and you weren't sure how to rightly respond? Do you find yourself in this season of life struggling to do the right thing in an environment where the wrong thing is so prevalent? Or in honesty and transparency, you say, my faith, Jason, is so weak because the suffering and the pain in my life currently or those that I love or the world that I observe just seems so strong. To you, I would say today, God sees, God knows, God cares, and justice will be served. Like you don't have to take things into your own hands. And what I mean by that is you don't have to manipulate, you don't have to retaliate, you don't have to get even. James is letting those that he loves and he shepherds, he's letting them know justice will be done and the return of Jesus promises that so you can be patient. I do wanna stop here and say something though that I think is important but would need even more time to unpack but it needs to be said. This isn't simply about turning your face away from those who have done you wrong or are doing wrong. Justice is a call for those who have wronged others to admit their wrongdoing, their sin both before God and those that they've wronged. So please hear me say this, justice should be pursued for God's sake, for others' sake, whether that be a victim or a perpetrator, as in uh, it's never loving to allow someone to go on sinning in grievous ways. Galatians 6 talks about that. But at this time, as James writes, there aren't avenues, especially legally, for them to pursue justice. But he wants to encourage them, hey, God knows, God sees, he will come back, things will be made right. And in that moment of his return, what you've always wanted, you will receive. And as a part of his encouragement, James gives them an example that they would have easily understood. They would have been able to think about it and process it. He says this, he says, see, look back with me if you would, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and the late rains. Now the idea of waiting here is to receive something that is beyond you, it's outside of you. So there's an expectation to receive something that is beyond our ability to be able to bring about. Now, believe it or not, and this may be a shock to some of you, uh, farming is not in my background. But 
the basic idea, the early rains are intended to make the soil soft so the seed has been planted, can come to life. The late rains allow the seed to produce something that is full and fruitful. Another way to say that is the early rains, they lead to life. The late rains, they produce fullness of life. And here's what the farmer recognizes. He has zero control over the rain. His life in every season is totally at the mercy of God. He can't produce rain. So what can he do? He can trust the design of God. He can work the ground, he can plant the seed, he can wait on the harvest because something precious is coming and God is the one who is producing it. The word precious there refers to priceless treasures. It also refers to purification. And you maybe heard a pastor talk about this in the past, like think of gold. It must be purified through the furnace for its worth to be revealed. And because James is primarily writing to Jewish Christians, their knowledge of the Old Testament would be strong. And they would probably recall in this moment as they read these words from James, they would recall Deuteronomy 11 where it says, and if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give the rain for your land in its season. The early rain and the later rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. James is reminding them the regular rains that God provides are reminders of his faithfulness, that he is a faithful God. So here's what that means for us practically today. No matter your circumstances this morning, someone has done you wrong, you're in a season of suffering and pain, someone that you love and care about is walking through a season of suffering and pain. No matter the level of difficulty, you too can wait and be patient because God is producing something precious and pure in you and through you. This isn't the first time James has told us this. If you go back to James chapter one, I'll just recap it so you can remember. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. There's all kinds of trials. For you know that the testing of your faith produces what? It produces steadfastness and steadfastness. Let it have its full effect that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. God is producing in us, even in the hard things you're walking through and I'm walking through, God's producing in us fruits of righteousness. God is transforming us, producing wholehearted life in us, even in our struggle, even in our losses, even in our weakness, even in our depression, even in our fears, even in our pain. God is producing life in us as he refines us from the inside out. So that means, and maybe this is an encouragement to you today, I hope it is, that means there's no such thing as a wasted circumstance. And that's the hope that we have to wait, to be patient as we await his return where he will make all things right. James reiterates this in verse eight. Look at, look at it with me if you would. He says, you also be patient like the farmer. Establish your hearts, or that could read strengthen your heart. That could read uh, stabilize your heart. That could read stand firm for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now here's what I've been pondering this week. What we see here is there is an uh, active, intentional peace to the call to be patient. Like for many people, the idea of being patient is passive. It's inactive. Being, saying be patient to someone can feel like a non-answer, right? to the questions that we're legitimately asking. Dad, when will we be there? Be patient. Like it doesn't seem like an answer. 
or on a much larger scale, God, why is this happening? Be patient. God, when will you make things right since you are a God of justice and righteousness? Be patient. God, how long will I suffer? Be patient. But it is a be patient and establish your heart. Strengthen your heart. Be patient and stand firm. Active, intentional, not passive, not lazy, not resigned. Again, as the farmer gets the ground ready and plants the seed, what is that? That's active, it's intentional. While he's waiting on the Lord to do what only the Lord can do, bring the rain. And again, James says it here, he says, the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now you might be tempted to think, James, you really miss it. Like if you were telling them this like 2000 years ago, that the coming of the Lord was at hand, woo, way off. But followers of Jesus all throughout the New Testament, they were telling each other, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Why? Because they saw him leave. It's not some theory to them. They saw him alive, they saw him crucified, they saw him risen, they saw him ascend, and they heard him say he was coming back, John 14, three. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. What does that mean? What that means is our waiting, our patience, our standing firm, our establishing our hearts is not in vain. He knows, he sees, he will make all things right. 